Can I ask you all to take a seat? We'll get started. Hello, Patrick. (laughs) Morning and welcome, everyone. My name is Professor Kobe Rudd and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Strategic Partnerships at ECU. Edith Cowan University's Vice-Chancellor, Professor Steve Chapman, CBI, CBE, and I welcome you and thank you all so much for participating today and coming along to the Edith Cowan Memorial Lecture. This is ECU's primary contribution to International Women's Day each year. I apologise that there's some people behind that screen who can't see me, but you'll see me later and I'll I'll wave. Before we begin, I need to just go over the standard general housekeeping. So please ensure your mobile phones are switched to mute or off and the closest restrooms are located in building 17 behind us. And just please refer to signage for directions. And all ECU campuses are smoke-free. A special acknowledgement to some of our guests. The Honourable Simone McGurk, Minister for Child Protection, Women's Interests, Prevention of Family and Domestic Violence and Community Services. Thank you for coming, Minister. Mr Patrick Gorman, MP, the Federal Member for Perth, with new baby Ruby and wife Jess. Ms Emily Hamilton, MLA, Member for Joondalup. The Honourable Albert Jacob, JP, Mayor of the City of Joondalup. Fiona Reid, Chair of the WA Women's Hall of Fame. Mr Mike Rowe, Director General, Department of Water and Environmental Regulation. And he was last year's International Women's Day Outstanding Panellist. And Mr Olman Wally, he is a Bulu Owner and Director. The Honourable Kerry Sanderson, AC, CVO, ECU's Chancellor. And... ECU current council members, Kelly Hick, Denise Goldsworthy and Jess Loomis, and our former pro-chancellor, Denise McComish. We also have Dr. Wafa El Adhami. She's the executive director for Science in Australia, Gender Equity SAGE, and she's joining us via live stream, wherever you are, Wafa. (laughs) And also our colleagues at the Southwest Campus, They're included via live stream as well, and I understand they're all together having their own International Women's Day celebrations. A special mention today to two ECU students, Olivia Colger and Amber Janovich. Amber and Olivia are just here, and they've graduated over the last two weekends at our graduation ceremonies, Amber in Bunbury and Olivia in Perth. And they're special guests here today because they're both keen advocates for gender and non-binary inclusion, with Amber continuing her research and beginning her journey to a PhD this month, and Olivia as a recognised WA artist and curator, with her exhibition providing safe and inclusive spaces for diverse audiences. And, of course, today we are joined by our wonderful guest speaker, Libby Lyons to explore this year's International Women's Day theme and discuss Australia's progress towards gender equality. However, first, I'd like to now introduce Olman Wally to perform the Welcome to Country. Olman is a Noongar man who is part of the Williman, Baladong, Binjareb and Wadjuk clan groups. And I'm particularly pleased to have such a male champion for equality at our International Women's Day event a voice that understands the importance of joining communities and valuing and respecting the diversity of people of all genders, ages, cultures and abilities. Thank you, Oman. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Kaya kaya nunuk. Hello, hello everyone. Kwa kerala, kwa penjeneng nunuk. G'day, and it's lovely to see you all. Ngan Chiri Chiri, Ngan Wulaman Baladong Binja Wajak Nyunga. My Nyunga name is Chiri Chiri, and on my mum's side of the family, I'm a part of the Wulaman and the Baladong clan groups, and on my dad's side of the family, I'm from the Wajak and Binja. In, in Nyunga way, or the, in my family's way, how I grew up, it's a matriarchal society. 
So we always say our mother's lines first. Uh, with the welcome to country, I'd like to share a little story or take you on a little journey um, and also speak about some of these things that I've got here as well. Um, I'd like to start by speaking about a very influential lady named Bulbuck, Fanny Bulbuck. She was born in Madagara, Harrison Island, and she grew up when Perth was starting to be built up. And she had what, what we call a run, that's a track that she'd take throughout the year. Um, her run started in Makaru or during the wintry times uh, around Karamunda, that's around the um, forest field in Hartfield Park. And then as the seasons changed, she'd make her way along this track out through Buralu, which is Perth, and then out towards Waradundi, the ocean, and then back along these tracks as well. And every now and then a house would be built up or a fence would be put up along this track. So she'd have a warano just like this one and knock it down and continue on her track. And if there was a house on the track, she'd walk straight through the front door, have a look around and straight out the back door again. And this is how she, she lived. She was a very strong person. Uh, they did kick her out of government house a number of times, government house gardens. Um, she cursed the occupants on a number of occasions and arrested a few times, had lots of friends and bailed out and went back and repeated the actions. And I be believe that's why they built that fence around government house gardens to keep her out. Um, we found out later that her grandmother was buried there. So that's why she kept returning to that, that same spot as well. She, she was a fighter for, for rights, equal rights for Aboriginal people, um, for equality. She had a grandson named Indi, oh, sorry, she had two sons. One of her sons was named Indich. Uh, Indich is where the family line Indich comes from. And Indich had a granddaughter named Violet who was born in York. Violet is my grandmother, my father's mother. Uh, Nena Violet, she lived a, 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 a unique not life. She was a part of the stolen generation and she worked very, very hard her whole life. She had siblings that she looked after. Um, she, she was moved from place to place. She kept escaping. So what they did was they took her and she put her to work with the men. So she worked on the railway lines with the men. Um, if you've driven on a Southwest Highway along the hills, there's a, just a bit, uh, not far from Byford, there's an old railway bridge that's been taken down. Uh, she helped build that bridge. She helped build the bridge in Bridgetown as well. She did a lot of work. Uh, she wasn't paid for any of her work that she did as well. Uh, on my other side of the family, my nana Janet, she was known as Jenabara. Uh, she was the matriarch of our family. Uh, Jenabara could be translated to the barefoot girl and she used to walk around everywhere barefoot and they called her princess because she was a part of the, the Baladon clan group around the Brookton area and Durham at the time was the, the main, one of the main elders. And Nana Janet, she was, she didn't uh, do the norms. I believe back in the day, it was very, very male orientated. Um, even as growing up, and I'd look at some of the commercials that you'd see, you know, the mums in the kitchen all the time or always at home and always doing the mum things. Uh, Nana Janet, she worked hard. She became the first Aboriginal JP. She traveled around Western Australia, helping remote communities in the North, and she traveled around Australia. And my grandfather traveled too with her. Um, so she was a very, very re remarkable, strong woman. Um, and we have these sayings, you know, Nana's always the boss. Um, Pop likes to think he's the boss, but in the end, he has to go back and consult with Nana, and then Nan makes the ultimate decisions in the end. Um, I, my mum, she is a very remarkable woman. Um, my parents divorced uh, when I was a very, at a very young age. We moved out to the country. So I lived uh, with my mum. Mum worked really hard 
her whole life and raised me and my siblings out in Brookton and Narragin area. Then when I got old enough, that's when I moved to Perth as well. Um, I did bring this Warner along to just talk about it. I borrowed it off my wife. She left before me, so I didn't ask for it. So I better not lose it. I'd be in big trouble. Um, with the Warner, the Warner is a stick that the ladies would use. It's a walking stick, hiking stick, digging stick. If there's fruit up high, you can knock it down. If there's a snake, give it a whack over its head, chuck it over shoulder, take it home for lunch. If, you, if the husbands were playing up, they'd get a whack over their back or if they had skinny ankles across their ankles. Uh, my stepmom has two for some reason. Um, so just thought I'd bring the Warner along. That's one of the tools that the ladies would use. But within what, what I've learned growing up with my, with my grandmothers and with my mum, not just about how society was a matriarchal society, but there was equality. It was a society that everybody was inclusive. It wasn't about having um, one leader in power to make the decisions. It was a group of people who led the group of people. A society that was very healthy. We didn't have police and prisons and, and hospitals, but this equality was what made it special, was what made it go and was made it grow. If we look at some societies around the world where it's mainly men led and men orientated, if you look at the society and say, okay, it's 50, percent women 50 percent men if you only give the men all these roles then you're limiting that society that society isn't going to run efficiently as well so mom and jenning in nunuk nunuk nini ngala buja kaya yang nunuk nanyuanju thank you for allowing me to conduct the welcome to country for this uh, international women's day event today and may the good spirits watch over you all keep you safe Keep you happy and may all the good vibes be with you today. Um, I also brought the didgeridoo along to play some nice little tunes. The first tune I'd like to play for you is called Kanya Waringin. It's a slow, relaxing, mellow tune. Uh, Kanya Waringin translates to the spirits talking. And then I'll finish up with Nyambi Mira, which is a more rhythmic, upbeat one. So get us all energetic and happy and all vibed up, ready for a big, lovely day today. Thank you, Almond. As you all know, International Women's Day is celebrated each year in March to recognise the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women, while also marking a call to action for accelerating gender equality. And Almond's given us a really good introduction as to why we're here. The theme this year is Choose to Challenge. 
That means being confident to challenge outdated social norms and harmful stereotypes that can prevent us all from achieving our goals. As you know, ECU is committed to this call for action. We're always looking for ways to counteract bias. Many of you know that in December 2018, ECU was one of the first 11 universities in Australia to receive an inaugural Athena Swan Bronze Institutional Award, a scheme led by Science in Australia, Gender Equity Limited SAGE. And we've got a couple of people here from SAGE. Um, in 2021, 2021, we continued moving forwards towards Athena Swan and we're actually embarking on our way to silver now. Last year, we were ranked in the top 4% of universities surveyed for gender equality in the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings, and we were recognised as a Women in STEM Decadal Plan Champion by the Australian Academy of Science. And just last month, we were named an Employer of Choice for Gender Equality by the Australian Workplace Gender Equality Agency for the fifth year in a row, and we're still the only university in WA to have this citation at the moment. Today's event marks our 13th annual Edith Cowan Memorial Lecture, which honours our namesake, Edith Dirksy Cowan. And this year is especially important because 2021 marks 100 years since, since Edith Cowan became the first woman elected to an Australian parliament. On your way in today, you may have picked up one of Edith, Edith's brooches, Edith's Tough Nut. Edith gave one of these to each member of her election committee as a sign of her appreciation and for its symbolic meaning. They had actually been told that the West Perth electorate would be a tough nut to crack and at the age of 59 she won that seat, defeating the then Attorney General. So ultimately the symbolism for us is that anything is possible. This year ECU also celebrates its 30th anniversary of being a university. We've come a long way many achievements, ranked in the world's top 100 universities under 50 years old in the Times Higher Ed, Young Education, Young University rankings. Our graduates have given us a five-star rating for teaching quality for the 14th year in a row. And this makes us one of only two public institutions to achieve that consistently high result. So I'd now like to invite Minister McGurk to deliver an introduction to our event today. It's a great pleasure to welcome Simone. She is the Minister for Child Protection, Women's in Interests, Prevention of Family and Domestic Violence and Community Services and the State Labor Member for Fremantle since the 2013 state election. Previously, she worked in the union movement for over 22 years. She was one of the first women to hold an elected position for the Australian Manufacturing Workers' Union She's been a very strong advocate for women and women's interests for over two decades now. Lots of achievements, but I think she's eager to give her introduction. But certainly WA Gender Equality Plan and the release of the Women's Report Card are just two things that have been major achievements by Minister McGurk. Please join me in welcoming Simone. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction and good afternoon, no, sorry, good morning everyone. It's great to be with you and happy International Women's Day. Uh, can I also um, pay my very deep respects to the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation and thank Omen very much for uh, his uh, welcome to country. Uh, I um, first heard about Fanny Bulbuck actually in the, some of you may have heard me mention this, but in the David Wish Wilson uh, book on Perth and if you haven't read that little book on Perth it's it's a great read and he talks about Fanny Balbuck uh, in there uh, and uh, I, um, I've been a big fan since then. I think it, it captures the connection to country, the determination, the strength uh, that uh, we see now um, in uh, our current Aboriginal population and one that I think we all agree we need uh, to work harder to get better outcomes for that community, including Aboriginal women and their uh, families. And that's something that I'm very determined uh, to do should I have an opportunity uh, in the next period of government. Uh, can I also acknowledge uh, special guests here today? Uh, my um, 
Labor colleague, uh, Patrick Gorman, federal member for Perth and his family, uh, Albert Jacob, the mayor of the city of Joondalup and Kerry Sanderson, AC, CBO, Chancellor of Edith Cowan University. Great to see you here, Kerry. And of course, um, Professor Steve Chapman, the vice chancellor from the Edith Cowan University and Kobe, uh, thank you for your introduction as your Deputy Vice-Chancellor. And can I also acknowledge the work that ECU is doing in regard to gender equity? And you can see from Kobe's uh, um, outline that ECU is being recognised as uh, a leader in Western Australia, but also in education fields for its work uh, in gender equity and particularly uh, around STEM and a very important area that's um, proving to be quite difficult. Uh, not to crack, uh, to use uh, uh, Edith Cowan um, metaphor there. And Libby Lyons, I'm looking forward to hearing you. Great to have you back here in uh, your home state uh, as the inaugural chair of SAGE and your work in Wajir as well. Um, I know you, you may be looking forward to uh, finishing up with Wajir uh, in uh, next month, I think. Um, but um, yeah, we're very grateful for your work and your enthusiasm in this area. Uh, I'm very conscious that in addressing you today as the Minister for Women's Interests, uh, there is still plenty of work in front of us if we're going to raise the tide of gender inequality. With the opportunities we experience in this state, every girl and woman should be able to reach their potential and achieve her aspirations, but sadly, this is still not the case. As we now know, 2021 marks 100 years since Edith Cowan became the first Australian woman uh, elected to a parliament in Western Australia. Um, but 100 years on, we still only make up 31% of the WA Parliament, so less than a third. Progress towards equality has been too slow and the time for action is now. Since we last gathered together to recognise International Women's Day this time last year, only days later, the full effects of the pandemic landed on our doorstep in this state. We know that COVID-19 has disproportionately affected women and highlighted the inequality girls and women face. So now more than ever, we need action to ensure we don't lose our hard won progress. The facts tell us that gender equality not only makes good business sense, but benefits the whole community. So this year's theme from the UN Women, that women in leadership achieving an equal future in a COVID-19 world is obviously very important. International Women's Day today is an opportunity to call on everyone to ensure that women are better represented in leadership positions and that we have a gendered lens on responses to the pandemic. In the face of COVID-19, it's vital that organisations and individuals are proactively taking steps to improve gender equality in their own industries and sectors. Women have been at increased risk of domestic and family violence, sexual violence, as a result of the uh, necessary lockdowns required to keep us safe from the pandemic. Women lost more jobs during the pandemic than men. And while employment has been recovering well, recovery in full-time employment for men has been double, double that of women. If the trend continues, it could exacerbate existing gender gaps. Certain recovery responses to the pandemic could also further disadvantage women. For example, early access to superannuation could further disadvantage women's retirement savings, which are already significantly less than what men retire with. Additionally, income support payments like JobKeeper and JobSeeker are set up in a way that means that women are more likely to miss out on these payments due to the casualised and interrupted nature of their employment. We need to remain focused and ensure that we prioritise women in our responses to the pandemic. It's been my privilege uh, to have the capacity to work and meet you, all of you over the last four years as the Minister for Women's Interests. The McGowan government has demonstrated its commitment to gender equality, something I'm very proud of. This time last year, we released Stronger Together, our, our plan for gender equality, the first of its kind in WA. This roadmap provides us with a path forward, not just for government, but for business, communities, and for individuals. I'm extremely pleased that as part of the plan, we've committed to 
uh, leading national efforts to voluntary uh, reporting uh, public sector data to the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. We want to use the purchasing power of government to enhance gender equality through our procurement processes. And we need to continue to increase the representation of senior women in leadership levels in the public sector. We've set a target for 50% of women in the senior executive service. When we came to government, only 34% of the SES positions in the WA public sector were women. And as of September last year, women now make up 42.5% of the SES. So this puts us well on track to achieving our target of 50%. We've now appointed female heads to three of the central agencies in the WA public sector as well, Department of Premier and Cabinet, Finance, and the Commissioner for the Public Sector um, are now held by women, which is significant. It shouldn't be unusual, but it is. There are a number of other achievements we have been able to progress. When we came to government, we had a target to achieve 50% of women on government uh, boards and committees. And I'm very proud that four years later, we've been able to uh, achieve 53% of women on government control boards and committees. And in fact, uh, just recently, uh, we were able to achieve that, including all boards and committees. Uh, it wasn't as difficult for those committees that government or cabinet has power over, but we often are reliant on local government or positions that are tied to by virtue of legislation or um, positions within uh, other agencies. So um, that's, um, that's been a, a task, but we've uh, been able to achieve that now with 50%, including development assessment panels, um, but 53% overall. Another achievement is to pass revenge porn legislation to criminalise the non-consensual distribution of intimate images. We've introduced legislation to establish safe access zones around abortion clinics and have committed to progress, progress this in the second term of government should be, be successful next Saturday. We've improved working conditions in the public sector that will ensure better outcomes for women and established ourselves as a leader in, um, for other industries. So we've had a significant conversion to permanency program and uh, over 70% of those positions that were previously temporary or on fixed term have now been um, that have now been converted to permanent positions. Seventy percent of those positions were held by women. We've introduced ten days paid domestic uh, and family and domestic violence leave, and paid superannuation on unpaid maternity leave. Another. Uh, 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 um, amongst the other improvements that we've put in place that will benefit um, women in the public sector. We've increased the funding to boost sexual assault services, so um, $800,000 uh, expansion to the Sexual Assault Resource Centre to include counselling and clinical psychology services uh, to women in the northern suburbs. And we've also made record investment to combat domestic violence. Since taking office in 2017, we've allocated $75 million of additional funding, uh, including building new refuges and piloting one-stop hubs as a soft entry point for victims of domestic violence. We've established another residential perpetrator program and trained WA police force in domestic violence in new protocols. And in this term of government, we've introduced significant and progressive law reform, including new criminal offences relating to domestic violence, making it easier, also making it easier and less traumatic for victim survivors to apply for restraining orders, um, and also given alternative options for uh, victim tenants to manage residential tenancies safely. And finally, we've funded Safer Venues WA to, walk to, to work towards making WA music venues safer places for women to visit. These are just some of the achievements that I've been proud to work with um, uh, alongside my cabinet colleagues. WA will be left behind unless we lift our game. We continue to have the highest gender pay gap in Australia at just under 23%, compared to the national average of 13.5%. And what I find particularly motivating is to have, uh, when, when I see the Victorian and South Australian gender pay gaps at around 9%. 
Collectively, we need to work together to lift the tide for women in our state. It's clear that if we want to see more equal, uh, we, we want to see a more equal future for WA, we all need to take responsibility for understanding the problem and putting in place a plan to address it. We must call out inequality when we see it. We must encourage our peers to step up with us and we must continue to lead by example in our day-to-day -day lives. Because gender equality benefits us all and makes our communities fairer, safer and better places to live. I look forward to hearing Libby's address to us and wish you all again a happy International Women's Day. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Minister McGurk. You've said it all very well, thank you. And uh, we are going to explore our progress a bit further and we're going to hear about the impact of COVID-19 and the effect that's had on us achieving gender equality. So. It gives me pleasure to introduce today's terrific speaker, Libby Lyons. As the Minister's just said, Libby is the Director of Australia's Government Workplace Gender Equality Agency and the inaugural Chair of Science in Australia, Gender Equity Limited. Uh, in 2015, just an example, she's been overseeing the process, the statutory reporting process that gathers gender equality data for more than 10,000 employees covering more than 4 million employees, 10,000 employers and over 4 million employees. So she's had a massive job and has been so instrumental in achieving the change that the country's on the journey towards. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Libby. Thank you, Kobe, and thank you to everybody who is here today, including um, the incredible distinguished guests and VIPs that we have here, but to all of you, thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners, past, present and those to come, of the land on which we stand today, uh, the Wujak Noongar people. And Omen, thank you. Oh, he's disappeared, but uh, what a wonderful welcome to country. I feel very privileged to live uh, in Noongar, on the Noongar Nation. So it's a great pleasure to be here indeed. It's fantastic to be in Perth, my hometown, uh, for International Women's Day and to join you here. It's such a pleasure to be at this esteemed place of learning, Edith Cowan University, named after an incredibly tenacious, smart leader, a pioneer, in the fight for women's rights and gender equality, Edith Cowan. It's an even greater honour to be delivering the memorial lecture in her name in the centenary year of her election to the West Australian Parliament, the first Australian woman to be elected to Parliament. In her maiden speech, she highlighted something which sadly today remains as relevant. She said, Many people think that it was not the wisest thing to do to send a woman into Parliament. Yet the views of both sides, men and women, are more than ever needed in Parliament today. I feel saddened that a hundred years after Edith Cowan made that sage statement, I feel the need to repeat it and fight on. I've been reflecting a lot on the theme of this year's International Women's Day, Choose to Challenge, asking us to challenge injustice and gender bias, to act individually and collectively, because through challenge comes change. I'm no stranger to challenge and change. My tenure as Director of the Workplace Gender Equality has taught me, taught me a lot about both. This time last year, I thought I was giving my last International Women's Day speech as the Workplace Gender Equality Agency Director, as my appointment was due to finish in October last year. But as we all know, 2020 was a year of challenges and unexpected changes. And so here I am today, genuinely in my final weeks as Director of the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, with the opportunity to share with you some of the challenges and changes I've witnessed. The Workplace Gender Equality Agency is a statutory authority 
established through the Workplace Gender Equality Act. Under the Act, every organisation in the, in the private sector in Australia with more than 100 employees must report into us on an annual basis and provide information on six gender equality indicators. Uh, as well as being a regula uh, regulator, we're also tasked with educating and influencing employers and employees to drive and improve gender equality outcomes in Australian workplaces. In April this year, the reporting period will open for our eighth year of data collection. The data we collect provides us with a very real picture of gender equality in our workplaces. And we use this data to provide real statistics and hard evidence to drive change. As a country, we must be really proud of this longitudinal data set. We are the only country in the world collecting the depth and breadth of data on workplace gender equality. This data set is a national treasure. And for the data to remain relevant in our changing labour market and work environment, we must regularly review the data we collect, we must refine it, add to it and protect it. The integrity of the data is critical and we must, must protect it. When I started as the director, like anyone in a new role, I had a lot to learn. I came from senior corporate roles in the mining and resources industry. In 2015, when I started, just 12.3% of key management personnel, usually the people, they're usually the people reporting into the CEO, just 12.3% of those key management personnel were women in my industry. That was less than half of the average number of female KMPs in all other industries. But I hadn't always worked in male-dominated industries. I started my working life as a primary school teacher in a female-dominated industry. It was actually in that job all those years ago that I learned firsthand the importance of working with a diverse group of people as it was always the voices and views of the few males around the table that really got the debate started and challenged the group think. When I started working in the mining and resources sector, of course the boot was on the other foot and I was often the only woman in the room throwing that different view or challenging that group think decision. So my experience of both male and female dominated industries has made me a firm believer and advocate in the benefits of a diverse and balanced workplace. Shortly after I started at the agency, I was involved in launching our second year of data, the results of the second year of mandatory reporting in Australia. That year, the gender pay gap for total remuneration was 24.7%. Now, this is just our data set I'm talking about. That meant each year, on average, women in Australia were earning just three quarters of the earnings of men. We also reported at that time that only 26.1% of key management personnel and just 17.3% of CEO positions were held by women it was clear that there was plenty of room for improvement. I recently presented the data from the 2019-20 reporting year, which captured the, uh, the period just prior to the pandemic. This is our seventh data set and our largest yet. It, as Kobe said, covers over 4 million, 4.3 million employees or more than 40% of Australia's workforce. Up until last year, I have always acknowledged that while progress in Australia was not as speedy as I would like, we were heading in the right direction. But it is clear from the current data set that progress appears to be stalling. 
The gender pay gap is always a very topical issue and it is important because as a statistic, it gives us a baseline for the state, for the feel of, state, of the state of gender equality in Australia. The gender pay gap is the difference between the average earnings of women and men across organisations, industries and the workforce as a whole. We refer to the total remuneration gender pay gap. When we refer to that, we include base salary and discretionary pay. So things like bonuses, shift allowances and performance payments. They're all included in the total remuneration gender pay gap. But the gender pay gap is not equal pay. Equal pay is, uh, became you know, a legal obligation of all employers over 51 years ago. And that is where we must pay women the same as men for doing the same job or a job of equal value. I'd love to stand here today and be able to declare that in the past half decade that uh, I've been director that we've smashed the gender pay gap down to the low teens or single digits, but I can't. And looking at the trends over the last seven years, I can absolutely tell you that change on that scale would be nearly impossible in such a short period of time. In truth, the gender pay gap still favours men across every industry, every manager group and every occupation. The total remuneration gender pay gap has fallen 4.6 percentage points from 24.7% in 2015 to 20.1 per cent today. Again, just looking at our data set. That means women are still taking home, on average, $25,534 less than men each year. So whilst I'll never complain about moving in the right direction, I will and I do complain about the pace at which, cha at which change is made. Witnessing the gender pay gap drop by about one percentage point a year is simply not on in my book. Employers must step up. They must analyse their data, discover their problem areas, put action in place, make employees accountable for the outcomes and report these outcomes to the executive and the board. They must continually monitor progress. Just like the regular reporting and monitoring of health and state safety data or sales revenue, gender equality must be embedded in every organisation as a standard business issue. Only then will we start to see change, real and systemic change that provides equal choice for career advancement and equality of working conditions for women and men, and then we will see a serious decline in the gender pay gap. Along with a consistent but slow decline in the gender pay gap, we've also seen consistent and pos uh, positive movements in some er other areas that we measure. There's been a steady increase in the commitment to flexible work. We have more women in leadership positions, and we also have increased provisions uh, for paid parental leave. In the 2019 KPMG report, She's Priceless, produced in conjunction with the Diversity Council Australia and our agency, one of the primary causes of the persistent gender pay gap was identified as factors relating to the gendered impact of children and family. This includes time taken out of the workforce, part-time employment and unpaid work and care, issues which still affect women more than they do men. So seeing a three percentage, po uh, percentage point increase in the number of organisations offering paid parental leave this year was actually really very heartening. Today, 52.4% of employers in our data set offer paid parental leave the highest it's ever been. Interestingly, but unsurprisingly, 
agency research shows that giving women and men access to paid per equal access to paid parental leaves helps foster a more equitable division of paid and unpaid work in the family. Enabling women and men to better balance and manage their work and home commitments. This in turn should lead to an improvement in women's economic security. Each year since 2016, Bankwest Curtin Economic Centre have partnered with us and analysed our data to un uncover new insights in gender equality in Australian workplaces. This year, the research un uncovered critical evidence of the importance of female representation in leadership roles. For the first time ever in the world, we were able to demonstrate a strong causal relationship between increasing the representation of women in leadership and improved company performance, productivity and profitability. For example, having a female CEO leads to a 5% increase in the market value of an average Australian ASX listed company or the equivalent of $79.6 million for that average ASX company. And that female CEO can lead to a 12.9% increase in the likelihood that that company will outperform those in their sector on three or more out of six key profitability and performance metrics. Despite this fact, women remain underrepresented in senior management and across our whole data set, this year, just 18.3% of CEOs are women. If we flip that, a staggering 81.7% of CEOs are men. The research showed lots of other interesting things uh, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll leave that. But what I will say, and I'll say it again very, very clearly, increasing the representation of women in leadership improves company performance, productivity and profitability. So if you are on a board or if you are in a senior leadership role and you are not acting on this hard evidence and the results of this report, in my opinion, you are not meeting your fiduciary duty to your owners and your shareholders. So I've given you a snapshot of the landscape that start at the start of my time at the agency and I've brought you up to speed on some of the progress and findings uh, we've made in the past five years or so. And whilst looking in the rear view mirror is always really, really important, I want to set you a challenge, a challenge to help us move forward. I would offer, like to offer just one way in which employers could introduce or amend a current policy that I think would be sure to expedite the pace of change in our march towards gender equality. As I mentioned earlier, there's been an increase in the number of organisations offering paid parental leave, with over 50% now offering it. But I believe greater uptake and a cultural shift in attitudes to caring responsibilities will happen when business abandon the concept of a primary and secondary carer and make parental leave universal, a universal entitlement. This would allow and encourage men to take the same amount of parental leave as women. It will help remove the stigma of men being active fathers and the barriers to career progression that often comes with extended breaks taken by parents in the early years of parenthood. This leave also needs to be flexible for employees. Insisting that a parent take, uh, take only one block of leave in the first six or 12 months of a new child's life does not always work for families. And our baby there is absolutely telling us that right now. So thank you. But in truth, 
It's not just employers that need to change here. So too does government. Government needs to change its paid parental leave scheme. Currently, only the primary carer is entitled to the 18 weeks on offer. Government needs to follow leading practice in the private sector and drop the primary and secondary carer labels and provide universal parental leave to all parents. No labels. I acknowledge that this will come at a cost to both government and employers in the short term. But as a very wise CEO I once worked with said, sometimes you must spend money to make money or save money. We need to have some longer term thinking here as the increased cost will be well offset by the positive outcomes, a decline in workplace absenteeism, an increase in women's workforce participation, a decline in the number of women not returning to work after parental leave. And all of these will lead to productivity improvements for organisations and the country, a healthier economy for us all. I truly believe that a fundamental policy like that will lead to sustainable, systematic changes in our workplaces with far-reaching effects on our country and our culture. It's got to be good. By any measure, 2020 was a year of extraordinary challenges. Bushfires, droughts, floods, and then the COVID-19 pandemic. An unpleasant surprise that snuck up on all of us and upended our lives and uh, upended our lives and the way we worked and lived. The effects of this contagion have had a big impact on women. Women have been at the forefront of the pandemic, both at home and at work, where they made up a larger proportion of the, the essential services workforce we so heavily relied on. Nursing, aged care, teaching, cleaning and childcare. All female dominated occupations in female dominated industries. The Grattan Institute just today released a report which stated that the COVID recession hit women much harder than men and will compound women's lifetime economic disadvantage. Women lost more jobs than men, almost 8% at the peak of the crisis compared to 4% for men. They shouldered more of the increase in unpaid work, including supervising children, learning remotely, taking on an extra hour each day more than men, on top of the already existing heavy workloads that they had. They were also less likely to get government support. JobKeeper excluded short-time casuals who, in the hardest hit industries, were mainly women. But the true impacts of these events on gender equality in our workplaces will not become clear until the collection and analysis of the data this year. The data employers submit to the agency in the next few months will be critically important in understanding just how these events have changed our workplaces and affected the lives of Australian women. I have over my time been incredibly privileged to work with many organisations and business leaders in Australia over the course of my tenure. I am so very grateful for the, the stories they've shared, the time they've given and their efforts in reporting. But I am now putting them all on notice that in the coming year they need to continue to dig deep, work hard and take action to keep gender on the agenda. I am an optimistic person and I cannot help but be struck by the opportunity that now lies open to Australian employers. In the face of upheaval, with global and local economics vulnerable to uncertainty, who will rise to the challenge of pushing gender equality forward? This challenge as an opportunity for Australian organisations and governments is a time to differentiate themselves, 
to embrace the social and economic benefits of gender equality and keep making the changes that really will shift the dial. I'm also in awe and thank the many Australian employees who have already, in the spirit of our theme for International Women's Day, chosen to challenge. They found their voice to challenge injustice and gender bias. Some have done so by themselves. Others have garnered the support of colleagues and friends. They've asked the tough questions of their employers and they've challenged the status quo. But today I'm going out on a limb and I really need you to find your voice. I need you to join with the voice of others. We need a choir of voices to choose to challenge. And you need to help me find my voice today. I need your help. And if you help me, then maybe this will help you find yours. Collectively, we need to rise to this challenge. Today, we are going to sing. Helen Reddy's huge galvanising hit in 1971, I Am Woman, was a huge inspiration to me and others. I was 10 at the time, actually, so that tells you how old I am. It captured the spirit of the times. It reminds me of my strength and my resolve to find my voice and to challenge. When I hear it and sing it, it boosts my spirits and it really energises me. So today, I'm hoping that you will do the same for me. I am no public singer, trust me. So I'm going to ask you all to stand and help me find my voice.
Thank you. And as you leave today and go about your business in the days, the weeks, and even the months ahead, remember you do have a voice. Remember you can choose to challenge. And if fear overcomes you, as it often does, remember today. Remember when Helen Reddy helped you find your voice. But remember, importantly, when you helped me find mine. Thank you. Thank you to Libby. That was just what we needed. What a fabulous address. Thank you again. And uh, thank you for the immortal words and inimitable style of Helen Reddy. I'd now like to open the floor to questions. Can you raise your hand if you want to ask a question, but can you also just give us your name um, and role if you feel that way inclined? Thank you. Yes, I've got one there. Hello, Christine Cunningham, School of Education. Thank you very much for all the speakers. Uh, so I work in the School of Education, so I'm in a very female dominated industry and yet my line manager is a man, my executive dean is a man, my vice chancellor is a man. And I was just wondering, uh, Scott Morrison said that he wanted to see women rise but not to the disadvantage of others. And I was wondering if it was actually time for men to actually help us and be challenged to step back and let us, girls, have a go. Thank you. Is that working? Yes. Um, you are in the same position as many other women right across Australia today. But trust me when I tell you that there are some fabulous men out there and your VC is one of them who is doing his utmost to help you find your wings, to help you climb that career ladder. But it's a call out to all of us here, a shout out to all of us. Help each other. We're not going to get there by ourselves. This is not, this is not a battle of the sexes. This is something that we have to do together. And as women, we need to help one another as well. And I have sadly often witnessed women not helping one another. So we all need we all need, as we climb that ladder of our career, to put our hand down and help the next person up and be proud of that. Be proud that you've helped someone because actually you will only ever be as good at your job as the people who are around you. So we, it's, a, it's incumbent on all of us and that's why we have to have our voice and find our voice and challenge that status quo. Yep, over here. Thank you. Hello, Prina Shah. I am a consultant focused on improving organisational cultures and developing leaders. My question is, how do we bring men into the game more so? How do we involve them even more? Uh, look, I think if I had the answer, I'd have the Nobel Peace Prize, but... Um, <laughs> But I think there are different things that we can do. I think we, we must keep engaging men. We must not push them away. We must keep engaging them. We, we must explain things. We must bring them along on the journey. We must acknowledge those wonderful men out there who are already doing so much. And we must ensure that we keep collecting the data so that we have the statistics that provides that very real picture. I cannot, I cannot emphasize that enough. That data provides us with the picture that then provides us with the hard evidence that proves that change is better, not just for an individual organization, but for our economy as a whole. And trust me, at the moment, we need it more than ever. And I think we should acknowledge that we've got some very, very influential male champions here today. I mean, we've got a federal politician, Patrick Gorman, who took parenting leave at a really critical time. Um, Albert Jacob, Mike Rowe, they're, they're really leading in their sectors, but also from an ECU perspective. I mean, I'd do a shout out to people like Braden Hill, Matt Byrne, Jonathan Padgett. We've got some 
very, very enthusiastic male champions here at ECU. There's a question in the front row. Um, thank you very much. Councillor Elizabeth Ray, City of Stirling. I also sit on the National Council of Women Board for Western Australia and I'm a um, former president of the Australian Local Government Women's Association, WA. Uh, I think it's very timely that it's a 100-year anniversary of Edith Cowan coming into Parliament. What I was going to ask you was that we only have one seat called Cowan in the whole of Western Australia named after a female. How do you think we go about getting the decision makers to ensure that electorates, state and federal, have some women's names? Thank you. Well, I think you can talk to the few people, few of the people that are here today and they can help um, influence. And certainly they've heard your voice today. And I think it is time we had more buildings and more electorates and uh, more statues and more acknowledgement of the wonderful women that have gone before us, the wonderful women on whose shoulders we stand. Uh, so I think this will all come. It will take time. I'm pretty impatient and I'll keep banging on about this to the day I die. But, uh, you know, we do need more acknowledgement and I think that perhaps we are getting to that real turning point in our history where, uh, I, you know, just over the last couple of weeks I have sensed um, a disquiet and a, I won't call it an anger, but I have sensed a real change in the way women are feeling and the way women are thinking. And uh, I think it, as a nation, we are about to move forward in a way that we've not seen before. We've got time. We've got a few, quite a few questions. Okay. Yep. Um, Amber in the front row and then we've got about three up the back there. Uh, hi, I'm Amber Janovich. I'm um, a graduate of ECU Southwest campus. I'm doing research at the moment into um, with gender studies specifically in non-binary representation. And what I've seen is there's a huge groundswell of, um, of, of people coming through who, rep who identify as non-binary. And I'm wondering, I'm just as I'm listening to your um, statistics and the data and that sort of slowing down of, um, of equality, I guess, um, if this non-binary groundswell is in response to that, in response to this sort of slowness of the changes of, of structural inequality. Um, and then, so what we're looking at is, is people coming through who've just said, actually, we've had enough of the, of the, the he and she and the, this sort of gender equality and looking at ways in which they can actually change the structure altogether um, outside of a gender binary. A very, very interesting question and one I have not thought of before, so thank you. Um, my gut says no. I, I, I tell you why I think things have stalled. I think things have stalled because employers, uh, and remember we only collect data from the, the private sector, I think employers in the first sort of five to seven years of uh, being um, required to report into us, realised that they hadn't done enough and they put their policies and their strategies in place. Um, and they thought, great, we've ticked that box now, we, we've dealt with gender equality. What they haven't realised is that a policy and a strategy in and of itself does nothing. You actually have to have an action plan in place and you have to implement that and you have to make people accountable for the outcomes of that and you have to report that to the board, all those things that I said before. So I think it is a... And a, 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 a sense of apathy that's creeping into the private sector, uh, believing that they've done enough, and of course they haven't. Having said that, I am great. I'm a great advocate for the private sector because, again, Australia is really the only country in the world where the private sector are leading the way in gender equality and the changes in workplaces. Every other country, it's being led by government. Government facilitated it here. But the private sector is leading the way and certainly when we look at leading practice initiatives, uh, the private sector um, are, are ahead of the rest. Okay, look, I think we've got time for the three questions that are hands are raised. Then we go to morning tea. 
Um, hi, my name is uh, Tim Flicker. I work in alumni relations at the university. Um, my question was just touching on something you already mentioned, Libby, about uh, parent paid parental leave, which I think is a terrific idea, 13 weeks paid parental leave for both men and women. But I guess another factor um, after parental leave is child health, health and um, in terms of daycares and the costs that face both women and men in terms of, you know, it's often cheaper to not work two days or three days a week because it's the cost of childcare is just like exorbitant so i'm wondering we saw in the pandemic there was this shift where there was sort of free childcare at, at a time is this something you, you see could be a factor in the future thank you i think we absolutely as a country have to have the very very um important debate about childcare. Childcare is way too expensive for um, most people and many people, uh, you know, I know many um, of my younger friends who actually go back to work for their, you know, be because they want to start to have a career or they want to continue with their career, but they're doing it and all they're do really doing is paying the childcare. So we have to have an intelligent, rational debate in this country about childcare and we have to acknowledge that it is not actually childcare, it is early learning, it is early childhood learning and education and we have a, uh, a universal education system um, in this country and I think we need to extend it to include early childhood education and learning. That's my personal view. Uh, I get a lot braver as I get towards the end of my tenure in saying these things. That is my personal view. But I also know from the data and from the research abroad that if we introduced a, such a system, we would it would pay it for itself many times over in increased productivity for the nation through women's greater workforce participation. Thanks, Libby. Last two questions. Oh, yeah. Thanks very much, Libby. Um, uh, Tom Gurker from Startup WA. Um, fantastic. And I agree the data is absolutely critical. So I'm just interested in what data do you think we're missing and specifically around startup and entrepreneurs that I represent. And just to let everyone know, we're having a Females Founder Summit sponsored by the state government later on this year. And I'm very interested in hearing from everyone who would like to be part of that. Um, thank you. We don't collect data from organisations under 100 because I think at the time, and rightly so, uh, reporting into us is a little bit onerous, um, you know, and, and people have got it down pat now and whatever. But, but to have placed that burden on smaller employers, I think, would have been too big a ask. However, we are introducing a new reporting and data management system this year in this year and that will allow for voluntary reporting uh, in, in the coming years of small to medium enterprises along with uh, governments which is very, very important and if we can, we can go along that track um, we will have an amazing data set. Things we're not, not um, collecting data on at the moment are things like the postcodes where people work. So at the moment we just get the data for the head office. Um, of an organisation and they tend to be in the major capital cities but to actually get the postcode of the place of work for an employee will give us a better picture to see what's happening in rural, regional and rural Australia. Age, age is really important. Uh, there are a whole number of different um, uh, issues that we've identified over the last seven years that need to be addressed and reviewed. Last question. Hello, my name is Greta Mukherjee. I'm the Vice President of Equity and Diversity at the ECU Student Guild. Um, I aim to advocate for all marginalized groups on campus. And as a female coming from a culturally and linguistically diverse background, my question for you is, how do we address the gaps that result um, as um, due to intersectionality in different dimensions? And again, I think that is some, uh, that is, data that we should be collecting. Um, it's the one area that the, the, the United States of America are doing better than us on. They do collect data around uh, ethnic background and whatever. And I think that it would be very valuable um, when we do a review of the Workplace Gender Equality Act to look at in, in, um, uh, collecting that data because that, again, 
will give us that real picture, will tell us where the problems are, will give us the hard evidence and give us a plan of action to tackle that inequality. Thank you. Thanks, Libby. And listen, thank you, everybody, for your great questions today and your surprisingly good singing. <laughs> Less dancing, but anyway. It's been a pleasure to have the Minister uh, do the introduction at, at our event and have our fantastic um, uh, Welcome to Country from Owen and, of course, have Libby share her enormous expertise and enthusiasm. So we're up for it. We are strong. <laughs> we are invincible. Thank you, Libby. I'd like to s present you with a small gift. Today's event's been recorded. It's available via the ECU Gender Equality website and the link will be sent out to you all. And before we close, I'd just like to thank a couple of people from my team, Jenna Arda, Michelle McVicker, and a special thanks to the corporate events team, Karis Hayes and Jane Graham, especially for all their hard work working with us, putting this together. This is the formal conclusion of the event. Thank you so much for attending and I hope you enjoy morning tea um, just out there in front of Edith Cowan House. Thank you, everybody. Happy International Women's Day.